how to outlast tough times part three how many of you know tough times are coming if your hand's not up watch this it will be up next week it will be up because hard times tough times tough seasons are coming see i believe there's a, a wrong theology going around especially here in camelsville uh, about you get saved and, and everything's just good. Say, admit, believe, and confess, and everything's fine. You you don't have to worry about anything else. Watch this. That's a lie from the pits of hell. When you get born again, saved, and truly convert your life over to Jesus Christ, you at that time truly become Satan's enemy. The Bible says in John 10:10 10, 10, that Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The first thing that Satan would do to you and I is steal our joy. If Satan can steal your joy, watch this, half the battle's over. You'll get down, you'll get depressed, you'll quit church, you'll want to quit your job, you'll want to kick your dog, I mean, you'll want to do it all. You'll want to do it all because you, Satan has stolen your joy. Now listen to me, how many of you are glad the big bad wolf will never beat the big bad cross? The big bad wolf, y'all help me preach now. It'll never beat the big bad cross. What Jesus did on that cross is still available, still good, and still ready now for you and I to get today. Amen? He wants you to grab it. He wants you to, he wants you to live in victory. He wants his church to live in victory. My God can outlast tough times. My God can get me through any depression, any anxiety, any worry, any stress. You name it, you fill in the blank, my God's bigger. And I'm going to stick with that until y'all bury me. That's just the way it is. Now, I'm telling you this morning, there's power in the name of Jesus. We sung about it. I'm going to preach about it. But there is power in the name of Jesus. I'm telling you, every demon in hell will have to tuck its tail when you say Jesus. Every demon will have to bow down and say he is God at the name of Jesus. Hey, Jesus works. Jesus works, and I'm telling you, when the churches get this concept, and people start dying to the flesh and their ideas and ideology, the intellectualism, all them big stinking words, when people learn to die to their concept, how church ought to be ran, and allow the Holy Ghost to come in and to fill his house, we'll have some church. We'll have some church. When people get out of the way, God will step in. I'm telling you, in the name of Jesus Christ, sometimes you just got to stand up and take your spiritual position. Your spiritual position will tell the storm, I command you, in the name of Jesus Christ, be still. You say, Brian, do you really believe that? Watch this. Yes. Yes. It's not up for vote. The Bible says so. Amen. How many know God's right? We're wrong. I just tell you the truth. Sometimes you got to stand up and say, in the name of Jesus. Boy, I love that name, Scott. There's no other name that a man can be saved by but the name of Jesus. There's no other person in this world can do what Jesus Christ does. See, we know it here. We know it here, but you've got to speak that over your situation, your problem, your trial right now. You've got to say, Jesus, God, I welcome you in. Jesus, it's not about what I'm thinking. I welcome you in. So today, I get the honor and the privilege of telling you guys that God is still alive. I get the honor and the privilege of telling you guys and ask you, how do you, outl how do you outlast your storm? How do you do that? Scripture says in Job chapter 28, that's where we're going to be taking our text today. Job chapter 28, yesterday evening, I was in the living room to give you a quick backdrop how it just came. This series sermon, God started birthing in my spirit about a month ago. And I always try to write down words that God gives me throughout the week. I put them on post-it notes. When you walk into my office, I got post-it notes on my, on my computer, post-it notes on my desk. I put post-it notes on Dana's head. I put them everywhere, hallelujah. So you come into my office, you'll see a bunch of post-it notes. And at the end of the week, every Thursday, I gather my post-it notes together, and I start compiling a sermon I really believe that God gave me. So all day Friday, I just sit down in the presence of God. I turn my phone off. Matter of fact, I usually hand my phone to Dana and say, here, you take my phone calls. And if people call, tell them I'm in the, I'm in the presence of God. And, and so that worked out pretty good. But Saturday, I got up and I started typing up and writing down some things that God gave me. And God changed it up. He changed it all, Allison. He made
messed me up, Sheila. I'm sitting there, and I'm like, but, Lord, I had it all together. I knew when I was going to preach, God, and, oh, it was a rhema word from heaven. And God says, good, put it in file 13, put it in trash can. And I'm like, seriously, Lord. And so I, I started typing up again and giving new words, this, that, and the other. And this morning at 2 o'clock, I thought everything was good. This morning at 2 o'clock, Brother Wayne, the Holy Ghost gave me a, a, a big old shove. I was laying in my bed, minding my own business, and all of a sudden God said, wake up. Wake up, wake up, Brian, wake up, wake up. And I was like, God, I'm sleeping so good. i got to be at church at 6.30 in the morning. Lord, please. And I even tried to roll over and say, God, I'll get back with you. How many of you know that don't work? <laughs> it don't work at all. And all of a sudden, I couldn't go back to sleep, and I got up at 2 o'clock. Oh, man, I went in the office, and I'm telling you, God gave me a word just for you today. I, re I really believe this. It's on my heart. Man, God switched it up. Messed me up. Now I'm sitting there going, God, what am I going to do? He said, now you've got to listen up. And so I'm begging you today, this word that I'm giving you, I really believe it's a word not just for me. It's for you. It's for everybody here. And if you're a guest, welcome to church today. I want God to love on you so much that when you walk out them doors, you say, my, my, I know I got a word from the Lord today. I know I felt something in my spirit just shifting me and shaking me like never before. Boy, I want that. How many of you glad you can still hear the Lord? How many of you are thankful that God still speaks and God still moves and God still got a voice? How many of y'all glad that God's got a voice and we got ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying? So I've got a word for you. And I really believe this is a word for you and I. So take note, Job chapter 28, verses 1 through 3. This is not going to make sense when I read it. It didn't make sense to me. But I started studying it. And looking at this stuff, and it makes sense now. Job chapter 28, if you're there, say amen. Here we go. If not, we got the big Bible on the big screen. Verse 1 says this: these words. Surely, everybody say surely. There is a vein for the silver. There's a vein of silver and a place for gold where they find it. Where they find it. Not find it. Find it. Where they find this stuff. Listen, this iron is taken out. Of the earth. Listen to this. And brass is molten out of the stone. Verse 3. I'm just going to read the first part of it. He setteth an end to darkness. Let that get in your spirit. Everybody say, He setteth an end to darkness. You ready? He setteth an end to darkness. Everybody say it again. He setteth an end to darkness. One more time. It's got to get in your spirit. He setteth an end to darkness. In other words, y'all watch me. If you're in the valley, if you're down to nothing right now, God says there is a final day for the dark times in your life. You won't be in the valley, hallelujah, forever. You coming out, and you're going to be stronger than ever before. How many of y'all believe that today? That God said, I set a time. Watch me, it's going to mess about you. Well, I thought he was sovereign. He is. But he said these words, I set us a time. He set us a time that the dark times are going to end. And God says, yeah, he said, I've set a time that you're going to come out of the valley. I've set a time that you're going to be stronger than ever before, that greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. God sets a time for the darkness to end. How many of you are glad that the dark times are not going to last forever? How do you outlast tough times? I told you uh, two weeks ago, number one, you've got to meditate day and night. Meditate day and night. What does that mean? That means you've got to self-talk. In other words, you can't, when the devil starts talking, you've got to start talking. When the devil starts saying you're a nobody, you've got to rise up and say, no, that's not what God said. He said, I'm a somebody. Well, you're not going to make it. That's not what God said. So meditate means self-talk. I've got to talk back. Here's what, what's wrong with Christians. Y'all ready? They, they just cower down. They just give up. Man, I'm telling you, listen to me. You know why prayers out of school? Because the Christians didn't stand up. You know why the Ten Commandments are not in D.C. right now in the Washington Capitol? It's because Christians didn't stand up. There comes a time. Y'all listen to this old pastor this morning. This may be some old school preaching, but I'm going to preach it anyhow. There's got to come a time when you stand up for what is right, and you've got to stand up for what is wrong. You say, it's wrong or it's right. This is what God said. I'm going to self-talk, and this is what the Lord said. You've got to stand up for it, guys. You've got to self-talk. Number two, you've got to be like a, a tree. 
You've got to be like a tree, a deep root, that when the wind and the storm comes, y'all remember, that it won't blow you away. We talked about the spiritual freezer. We talked about that, that God sometimes puts you in a spiritual freezer, not to say he's not going to use you, but he's just not going to use you now. He's going to use you later. See, God came up with the now later. It's not that candy group, but anyway. And the third thing is, how do you outlast tough times? My point today, one point. Y'all ready? Say, I'm ready. Come on, y'all talk back to me. I'll preach about 15 y'all and go home. I'll go to Lee's Famous Recipe or wherever y'all want to go. Here, how do we outlast tough times? One thing. Surely there is a vein of silver. This don't make sense, but write it down and you'll get this word in just a moment. See, Job was a blessed man. How many of you know Job was blessed? He was blessed. He had a beautiful wife. She was a knockout. Beautiful. Now, she wasn't as pretty as my Dino. She was like Drano compared to my Dino. You know what I'm saying? When God says that, I just got to tell you. You know what I'm saying? He had a beautiful wife, Mrs. Drano. I'm joking. He had seven sons and three wives. Listen to me. He was rich. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camel. He had 500 oxen. Watch this. He had 500 donkeys. I don't know if that's a blessing or not, but he haul anyhow. Anyway, you know what I'm saying? He had a big house, and he was the richest man in all the east. He was the richest man in all the east. And y'all listen to me, but there came a day. There came a day when all this would be tested. Y'all watch this. Don't think that you're going to get saved and everything's just going to be hunky-dory. There's going to come a day that you're going to be tested. There's going to come a day when Satan's going to come against you and he's going to try to tempt you and test you and try you. But I'm telling you, there's coming a day also when darkness has an end. But until that time, we as Christians have to tell the, tell the old devil to shut up. Hallelujah. You got. You say, Brian, did you really say shut up? Yep, I'm going to say worse than that in just a moment. But listen to him. There comes a day when all of us will be tested. Job was. Now, Job lost everything. Y'all watch me real quick. He lost his children. He lost his children. He lost all ten of them. He lost his house. He lost his livestock. He lost his wealth. He lost his health. And now we have a man that is sitting in a pile of ashes with sores all over his body. I want you all to understand something before I get into this word. God does not cause sickness or disease. I know this is a word that goes totally against a lot of lot of doctrine, a lot of theologies. Watch this. I don't care. They can't prove it in the Bible. God does not cause sickness or disease. Sin brings forth death. Sin brought forth sickness. When Satan, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden because of Satan, watch this, it brought sin into this world. We today, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 12, sin has been imputed and has been brought on to you and I. But watch me. God is love. God loves you. God loves me. God loves us all. You say, well, Brian, I just don't understand how come there's sickness. I just told you that. Now watch this. God don't have a bunch of angry angels sitting on a black cloud waiting for you and I to mess up. God don't have a big whip in his hand when we mess up. He's going to say, oh, I'm going to smack you down hard, sis. He don't do that. God is love. Listen, Job reminds us about this. Job reminds us about life, about sickness, about death. We buried two people this week, 12 and 13. Watch this. I don't understand it. But I know this. One day, everybody here is going to take your last breath. That's why we do not have time to fuss and to argue and to have all these things going on. There's too many people dying and going to hell for us to sit there and have a debate who's right and who's wrong. Is the Baptist right or is the Catholic right? Watch this. They're both wrong. Whoops. It's not about a denomination. It's about a denominator. And his name is Jesus Christ. It's about when churches come together for one cause and one purpose about Jesus. Somebody praise him in the house today. That's what it's about. It's not about living in the safe zone. It's about living in the faith zone. Why does God, listen to me, I'm going to mess y'all up real big time now. Do y'all realize that Satan's got to get permission before he messes with you? Satan has to go to Jesus before he can get to us. You 
tell you why. Why does God allow Satan then to tempt us? That's all he can do is tempt you. It's nothing wrong with being tempted. The sin is when you fall into the temptation. Y'all got that? How many of y'all got tempted today? I I woke up and got tempted today. Praise him! It's not nothing wrong with being tempted. It's about if you fall into the temptation. See, God is more concerned about your character and about your holiness and about his will than he is your comfort zone. Could you imagine if nobody in here ever got tempted or tested? You talk about a sissy coat. You talk about a bunch of babies. Lord, it's bad enough as it is now, Jamie. Could you imagine if we all got our way, we never had storms in our life, nothing ever used faith. Yeah, never have to use your faith. Could you all imagine never just going through life and just getting your way and everything you happen? I don't want that kind of church. I want a church. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. I want a church that has been tempted and tested and went through the fire and come out saying, hey, my God is good. He's great. He never left me. I've seen him. I've felt him. I want that kind of church. I want that kind of people around me that's been through the fire. That when I look at somebody and say, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I do. Hallelujah. Listen to this. All this was going on. And Job reminds us. He said, here I am. I'm in my midlife. I've lost 10 of my kids. Y'all think about it. I lost my children. I lost my house. I've lost my family. I've lost my livestock. I've lost my wealth. I've lost my health. And only thing, listen to this, this is powerful. Job did something that just blew me away. He got a razor. He had Scott on his mind. He shaved his head. He shaved, he did, Job shaved his head. Next thing he did just blew my mind. He tore, he rent his clothing. I know this is rated R. Y'all hang with me. And the next thing you know, he, he shaved his head, he tore his clothes, and he went and sat in a pile of ashes where his children's house just burnt. He went over there and he sat in a pile of ashes. And I just see Job now. Here he was, naked, bald, and sitting in ashes. You say, Brian, what would happen today if somebody was bald, naked, sitting in ashes? The cops would be there in five minutes. Because we think people are crazy. So watch this. Job, sitting in ashes, tears coming down his face, he looked up and said something crazy. He said, surely there is a vein of silver. Surely there is a vein of silver. Now I know you're probably looking at me and saying, Brian, that went really over my head. It did me too until I started really studying this. Job was going back to when they used to mine in those days. Going back to miners, when they would go into a mine, it would be dark. It would be cold. Nobody would be in there. You couldn't even see what was in front of you next. Sort of like our life today. Some of you may be stuck in a valley right now. Some of you may be going through a trying time right now. You feel like you're in the middle of a mine. You can't see what's in front of you. You can't. All you can do is hear, and you've got to trust the voice of God. And all of a sudden, God welled up in me. See, what Job was doing, he was, he was reminding us about a miner about somebody walking into a mine. And the Lord welled up in me this morning at 2 o'clock, and he said these words. He said, if you go into a mine to find silver, watch me, you've got to have the right clothes, you've got to have the right equipment, you've got to have the right light, and watch this, you've got to have the right pick. Y'all hang with me just for a moment. You've got to have the right clothes, you've got to have the right equipment, you've got to have the right light, and you've got to have the right pick. And here's what God told me early this morning, Scott, and it just brewed in me, and I can't get over it today standing in front of you. I'm excited about this. God said these words. He said, you tell the people this. You say, Brian, did you hear him? Watch this. I felt him. My heart started beating fast, and there I was in my recliner, and here I started writing, oh, geez, 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 geez. And I said, oh, God, it's going to be good. God told me to tell you he has clothed you with righteousness. Listen to me. He has given the church the right equipment to do whatever it takes to get in through any situation. He has given you the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, your feet to be shod with the gospel. He said, I've given them the right light. If you read the Bible in Matthew chapter 5 and 6, 
He says the life is the Holy Ghost. He says these words, I put a built-in life. That even in a dark valley, bad situation, all you've got to do is you stand up, be clothed in Jesus. You've got the armor on and let your light shine for God. Hallelujah. Let your light shine for God no matter what. See, listen to me. A lot of y'all right now, I'm telling you, some of you right now are so depressed in here. You're going through, I'm going to call it out. You're going through depression right now. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we break that curse in this church right now. Listen to this preacher. I'm telling you, I'm going to preach the Lord to you. This may be my last sermon, but I'm going to let you have it. He said, I've clothed you. Hallelujah. He said, I've, I've given you the right equipment to go into a dark situation because I'm telling you where the light is, the darkness has to flee. Now watch this last word. It's going to help you all really good. He says, make sure you got the right tools. Notice the only offensive weapon to a soldier was their sword. The sword was the word. Watch this. When a miner goes into a mine, all he's got is a pick. And he'll start hitting rocks. He'll hit the hard spots. My God, I hope y'all get this word. He'll start hitting areas in his life that he normally run from. See, most Christians run from trouble, and God runs to trouble. Most people say, it's too hard for me, Brian. I can't do it. And here's the word God gave me to give to you this morning. He said, Brian, tell them to swing the pick. Tell them to keep swinging the sword. It may not look good. You may be in a valley. You may be in a dead situation. You may have a bad doctor's report. But hallelujah, keep swinging the pick. Somebody praise him. Keep swinging the pick. Keep swinging the pick. And I promise you, because watch this. That old pick hit a hard rock. And he keeps hitting it. Keep swinging the pick. Keep swinging the pick. You know what happens eventually? Sis, that rock busts open. And they find silver. Now here's going to blow y'all's mind. Y'all ready? See, I got you, preacher. Silver, according to the Greek, and according to the Hebrews, means one word, redemption. This is good. God says, if you keep swinging the pick, and you don't give up, if you keep swinging the word, you stand on my word. When the world don't like you, you stand on my word. When the doctors give you a bad report, you stand on my word. When people are coming against you, you swing the pick and keep standing on my word. And if you keep doing that, you keep hitting the hard spots in your life. Don't run from them. Don't run from them. Most churches run. Don't run from them. You keep swinging the pick and standing on the word, the rock will come open and you'll find redemption in the rock. My God, that's a good word. You'll find silver in the vein. You'll find redemption in the hard spot. See, listen to me. I know this goes totally against what church people have been taught for many years. But listen to me. The other thing, you do the best you can. God says keep swinging the word. If you can't handle it, Ross, this is going to be tough. Go to the doctor, and maybe they'll give you something to get through your hard time. That's not what the doctor is. Jesus is the doctor. He is the physician. He's the, he's the hill climber. He's the water walker. I feel the Holy Ghost. He, he does what he says he's going to do. He'll come through. The world. Guys, y'all not figuring this out? People in the world and pastors and churches will let you down. But my God, he will never let you down. Somebody ought to praise him because it's true. Woo! Hey! My God, it never lets you down. See, we know that here in our minds, but I'm telling you, so many people have dropped the pick, and God says, pick the pick up, pick the pick up. And swing it. Swing the word. Swing the pick. Keep hitting the rock. Keep hitting the hard place until it busts open, and then you'll find redemption. Most people in marriages, are y'all ready? Y'all ready for this? Oops, here we go again. Oops, here we go. We have a problem. Listen, if you think you're going to get married and never have problems, don't get married. Bunch of sissies. I know y'all. Oh, yeah, you better raise your hand. It's the truth. If you think you're going to come to church and never have a problem, you might as well get up and leave and start another church right down the road. Because watch this. You can start 100 churches. 
and there's still going to be problems. God is looking for some people to pick the picks. God is looking for some people that have swing the pick. I don't know if y'all feel it, but I feel the Holy Ghost staring up here. Woo! Hallelujah. You say, I'm, I'm new here. I don't, I don't like loud churches. Well, we ain't going to stop because there ain't no party like the Holy Ghost party. And we done found out if you preach Jesus and you give him praise and swing the pick, drugs will leave, depression will leave, anxiety will leave, fear will leave, worry will leave. Hey, hallelujah. We believe it. We believe it at this church. We believe in Jesus at this church. Woo! My God. Hallelujah. Tom, what load you going on? What load you going on? First load. See, silver in the Bible, you won't get this message until you get this word right here. Silver means redemption. Write it down if you're taking notes. He says, surely, surely there is a vein of silver. Surely this is not where God wants me to stay. Job sitting in ashes, naked, and a bald head. And here he is getting, I'm not going to get naked and shave my head. <laughs> I knew that was coming. Welcome to Elkhorn, right? He sat down, and he looked up. He says, surely there is a vein of silver. Surely, God, you didn't take my ten kids. Surely there is a vein of silver. Surely there's going to be some redemption in this mess. Do y'all really believe that God puts you where you're at? If he puts you where you're at, don't you think he'll give you a way out? No matter how bad it gets, no matter how bad the circumstances are, no matter where you're at in your marriage, no matter where you're at in your church, I'm telling you there's a storm that is rising, and God is the storm maker, and he can change the weather. He can change the weather. See, God's just looking for some people to pick up the pick. So listen, Job said, here I am in the middle of a mine. I'm in the middle of a valley. Dark, cold, can't see anything. I am depressed. Watch this. I'm going to be honest with you this morning. Depression tries to come at me all the time. It really does. I know that may shock y'all, but depression always tries to come at me. You know what I do? I'll let God answer the door. No matter what comes at me and knocks on my door, I'll say, hey, Jesus, will you get that? If fear comes at you, if anxiety comes at you, depression comes at you, listen to me. Let God answer the door. Let God go to the door. Let God answer that. And here's what he said. Watch this. I'm going I'm to blow you all away. Job 64, he said, surely there is a vein of silver. Now, I'm going to show you something amazing in the Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. Bet you never read this before. I'm going to teach y'all just about two minutes, and then we'll, we'll conclude this, okay? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. Remember, surely there is a vein of silver. Silver means what? Redemption. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a... He's not going to go... Um, he's going to shake it. It's going to be so loud, the whole world's going to hear it. With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. That word trump right there, listen to me, means redemption. That word trump equals redemption. So what he's saying is surely I'm not on earth fighting for nothing. Surely, I may be going through a little hell in the hallway right now, but I want to hear the silver, silver trump. I want to hear the redemptive trump. And right now, if the horn were to sound and the archangel shout, you know what's going to happen? There's either going to be a pile of clothes on your chair or you're going to be remained here. He said these words, I love this. The silver trump is called redemption. So in other words, when the archangel blows the trumpet, the silver trump, it's redemption time. It's going home time. It's redeeming time. It's God coming back time. So when you read that in that verse, what you can say is this. Surely, there's a, there's a trump called silver. 
Surely there's going to be a trumpet that's going to sound. It's going to be the, be the redemptive ser- sermon. It's going to be the redemptive service. And listen to this. God gave me this. Pray to you guys tonight. Also, there was a vein of silver on the cross. Remember, silver means redemption. I want y'all to think about this just for a moment. When that old nail went through Jesus' wrist, y'all remember that? One arm went here, one arm went there, and the leg crossed here. They said the nail at the bottom was approximately 18 inches long. He had to go through both of his legs. He goes through the post, and he go to the back, and then they turned them over. They nailed them down where it couldn't come back out. According to Josephus, the great Jewish historian, he said these words. When those nails went through his wrist and went through his legs, it hit something called blood veins. Y'all know blood veins? And listen to this, that silver started pouring out. Because why? What happened on that cross when they nailed him and the blood was shown, that was called the blood of redemption. That was called that you and I don't have to die and go to hell. You and I can make a decision today to live in the redemptive power of Jesus Christ. Because when he died, it, he bled silver. He bled silver. Listen to this. I thought about how the people who nailed Jesus to the cross on Friday, how they must have felt. Jesus, here's an amazing, amazing story. I studied this out. Do you know that tomb and mine had the same meaning in the, in the Greek? So when it says they put Jesus in an old, cold tomb, it was really like they were saying they put Jesus in an old, cold mine. Amazing. Listen to me. It's a good word. When they nailed him to the cross, I imagine people who were down there were sitting there going, Wow, he's dead. So we're going to put him in an old cold tomb, old cold mine. It's going to be cold. It's going to be dark. And according to Jewish scholars, they, they laid Jesus' clothing beside him. And they put his head on a rock. I'm going somewhere with this. And also they put a big old rock in front of the, the tomb to mine. Because they, they knew deep down in their heart, they said, hey, this man, he, he's, been, he's been raised to dead. What if he tries to come out of this old tomb again? We better put a big old rock in front of it so he can't come out. And I, I started thinking about this on Friday. They started thinking, it's this, oh, he's dead. He can't get back up. We put him in an old cold tomb, an old cold mine. Laid his clothes beside, beside him and laid his head on a rock. And even put a big old rock in front of him. Oh, sadly, they came. They went back, and I can see the old soldiers walk by the old tomb, and the rock was there. Who knows? Nobody knows. They may have rolled that old rock away just to look in there and say, hey, he's still there. Me, that's, I'd probably have done that. Put the rock back in front of the old tomb. But you know what they forgot about? That Jesus was too. <laughs> they forgot about that he was the word, and he was the sword. That he, you can't kill Jesus. And they put him on the cross, and he, he, he's up on that cross for six hours one Friday. They took him off and laid him in a tomb in a mine, put him down there, put his clothes beside him, rolled a rock up there, but oh, my God, had a pick. And boy, on Sunday morning, early Sunday morning, they said that Peter and James and Martha and John, all of them ran to the tomb, and Peter outran them. Hallelujah. And boy, I love this. I love this story. It means so much to me. They ran to the tomb and they said, oh, where's Jesus? Why, why you seek the living among the dead? And all of a sudden, they knew the pick was swinging. All of a sudden, they knew that the earth was shaking. All of a sudden, they knew that the heavenly choir stood to their feet and said, he's alive. All of a sudden, they stood up to their feet and said, my God is alive. He swung the pick. He swung the tomb doors open. My God swung the pick. Oh, come on and stand to your feet. All over this house, stand to your feet and give my Lord praise in this house. Surely, surely, I see Jesus now. Surely, there's a vein of silver. I can see some of you now going through the storm. Can I tell you to lift your head to Zion and say, surely, there's a vein of silver. 
Surely that silver means redemption. And I just think about Jesus. You know, he didn't die on that cross for me and you to say, whatever happens, happens. There is a purpose you're here today. How do we outlast hard times? Watch me, guys. It's coming. If you're not in it, you will be. If you're coming out, you'll go back in it. Welcome to life. Welcome to life. Welcome to being a Christian. Now Satan don't own you. He used to own you. Now you're God's property. And Satan can't stand it. So he's going to tempt and test and try, steal, kill, and destroy. But surely, oh God, surely as I said in these ashes, there's a vein called silver. How do we get out of it? We meditate day and night. We self-talk. We're like a tree, number two. You're planted by the streams of living water. you got deep roots. In other words, when the storms come, you don't run. You stand and fight the good fight. Number three, surely, surely, there's a vein of silver. Surely, my marriage is, I didn't, I didn't, listen to me, I'm going to be honest with y'all. I've been married to Dino coming on 20 years. I done put 20 years in that girl. And I tell her this all the time. Y'all think I'm crazy? I don't care. I said, Dino, if you try to leave, I already got a bag packed too. You can't outrun truth. You can't outrun real. I'll catch you. I caught you the first time, and I'm still quick after 20. I'll catch you the second time. You ain't going nowhere. You say, Brian, what if she wants to leave? Watch this. She won't because what God puts together, they stay together. Y'all got me? Quit worrying about all that junk. Live out your salvation. Have joy in God. Put a smile on your face and say, surely there's a vein called silver. How many of y'all believe there's a vein called silver? There's a vein of redemption. That when Jesus died on that cross, he said, watch this. It is finished. This is what we're living in. Oh, it's good. We're living in the finished work of Christ. About that. When y'all see me, I'm clothed in righteousness. When you see me, I've got God's armor on. When you see me, I'm gonna be shining so bright, the Holy Ghost is gonna shine through me. I got a built-in light. And I've got a pick in my hand. And I'll hit the hard spots in my life. I'm not gonna run. I'm gonna meditate. And I'm going to be like a tree. And the wind blows and the people talk. I don't care. My God's for me. And he'll get me through the storm once again. Somebody praise him in the house today. Come on and praise him like you're going through. Praise him like you came through. Surely there's a vein of silver. 